Hello, Instagram family. We are here again for another candid conversation. And I know that every time I get on a candid conversation, I tell you that you are going to love the guest and that I can't wait to talk with them. It just so happens that most of the guests that I have had on are people that I actually really adore and love and care about. And so for many of them, it's been a while since we've chatted. So you're like a bug on the wall when we are engaging in these candid conversations. So we are welcoming on Dr. Ah! Oh my goodness. I am loving all of this. All of it. Oh my gooseness. I'm like, I can't even control myself. I'm screaming in the um, camera. Alana, Doctora Alana Anderson, you look fabulous. Oh, I can't hear you, Mama. I can't hear you, Nana. So, what I'm going to do is introduce you to the folks that are here. So, I, I want to tell you a funny story of how I met Alana. I don't know if Alana remembers this, but Alana. I think I, I know up... exactly what you're talking gonna say. <laughs> so Alana and I grew up in the same neighborhood, and we were actually living in the same building. And I remember always seeing Alana so cute in her Catholic school uniform, hair always done, so adorable. And I was in the supermarket, and she approached me to sell me. Now, y'all that been to Catholic school know them folks that sell them delicious, world's finest chocolates. Uh -huh. So she asked me if I would purchase some. And I don't know what was it about that particular interaction <laughs> that I said, oh, my God, yes, you were with your mom, who yes. I also adore and <laughs> love. And that just began, like, this friendship or, like, mentorship. I don't even remember. Oh, I think you needed hours. <laughs> For your confirmation or something, and then yes. you were like volunteer. <laughs> Probably. Oh my! I'm so sorry. I'm acting up today, y'all. <laughs> I just I get so excited when I see uh, Doctor Alana Anderson. So, it, which makes me all the more proud, right? Um, you know, I mean, I asked you to send me a bio, and I read it, and I teared up. Oh, because I'm just so proud of who you are, so proud of what you have done with your current career and continue to do, right? You've been doing higher education work for the last 15 years. Yeah, yeah. Has it been that long? And now yeah. you've delved into the world of diversity, equity, and inclusion with like a bang, right? Yeah. yeah. And before that, right, you... You went to get your undergraduate degree. You were part of like the Posse Network, right? Then you went and got your master's. I think I've been to every single one of your graduations. You have. So Dr. Anderson is like my little sister. Yes. I, the little sister that I never had. <laughs> um, if y'all saw the interviews that I had with uh, Maria and with Iris. So they talked about that it was three of us that I used to make them I used to make them write out their goals and Alana was part of that crew <laughs> yeah yeah it was like you were on to like vision boards before vision boards were like a thing which is funny because I don't even rem I didn't remember that but anyhow so tell me so I I was talking to a, a Dr. Anderson and we were catching up because we hadn't talked in a while and I was so inspired for your journey that I was like, would you please come on the candid conversations? And you were like, <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure. Because I wanted to brag about you, right? And then when you shared what you wanted to talk about, that hit me so deeply, especially since I just completed my doctoral journey, right? And I think there were several conversations you and I had throughout where I almost was like, well, how the heck did you do this? Working full time and managing a doctoral studies, right? So let's start with, tell us who you are, 
what you bring to the world, right? Yes. Tell us a little bit about, you know, a little bit of your trajectory, and then yeah. we're going to get right into it. Well, thank you for having me on. I have to, my natural inclination, and I guess this is like connected to what we're talking about, but my natural inclination, lots of times I'm pretty introverted and quiet. I'm a little quieter. So I'm usually like, no, I don't want to do <laughs> But I can't say no to you. So um, I leaned into yes and came from a place of yes with this. Um, but yeah, I am Alana. I grew up, Cindy and I grew up, in the same neighborhood. Um, we lived floors um, away from each other. And um, I guess like integral to my story is my mom is, an, I'm an, uh, the child of an immigrant. My mom immigrated to the US from Trinidad in her 20s. And really, I think from her, I sort of learned and watched um, I hate to say the immigrant story because I feel like that's overutilized, but mm -hmm. the story of a person who wanted more right and so you know she worked she was a non-traditional student came to the country got her GED did community college and then transferred to a four-year institution and really always I'm an only child so she was very particular about my experience who I was around who sort of surrounded me but also that you know my trajectory was to go to school do well go to college and then kind of figure out from there what I was to do. I always had thought I was going to go to law school um, and be a lawyer, but that sort of shifted when I got to college. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so I mean, I grew up in the South Bronx. I'm, I, I live in Boston now, but I still hold New York City as like my hometown and where I'm from. And I think I probably always will. Um, but yeah, I've amassed three degrees and... Um, <laughs> And now I work in a higher education space where, you know, I get to utilize my degrees, but also my lived experience as a student of color, going to predominantly white schools, and in some ways pay it forward, I think, for sort of the opportunities that I had, but also to not, um, to help folks not forget how hard it is to be mm. not white in wow. spaces that are very white um, and to help people recognize the importance of making more space and shifting practice to make spaces more inclusive and to sort of put our money where our mouth is. Like mm. I work in higher education. They talk a lot about diversity and the value of it. So reminding people of that and then also what more needs to happen to, to make spaces better and more comfortable for folks so yeah wow wow so <clears throat> i remember going to mock trials right when you were in high school yeah and you had this whole idea about you becoming a lawyer and i'm just so curious because folks that are listening i want them to hear like what happens in a trajectory and also, that decision that you made to be a part of Posse, to go to a school that you went to. I remember the stories you used to talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, let's talk about that. So you got to Brandeis, right? Yep. And what was it while you were there, right? A beautiful, powerful Black woman from the Boogie Down Bronx in Massachusetts. Tell us about that experience. You know, I, so, I mean, there are a couple of pieces to the experience. I went with a group, right? So I got this scholarship and they sent 10 of, well, nine, including myself, 10 of us. Um, at this point, when we went to campus, we had had about almost six months worth of like training and workshops to sort of prepare us for what it was going to be like, but also to get us connected to each other. So we had like a support group. Um, and I remember I got there and I was, I started to be really aware of mm -hmm. how I grew up and how vastly different it was from how other people grew up um, in terms of wealth and class and all of that. Um, but I also think I remember 
never feeling it's a weird thing because i think when you when you go into new spaces you could either it can reflect back on you to think like oh my space wasn't good enough I, i didn't have enough um or you could be like oh no i really had a great space even with lack thereof i still had and so i think i remember never feeling like in ashamed or embarrassed to talk about like where i was from or like what i experienced but i also wasn't advertising it i'm a little more of a private person (laughs) so you know (laughs) i think like i i curate a space in the way that like if someone's asking me lots of questions i'm sort of like answering but also sort of like throwing it back on the other person so that I don't have to I think that that's that's a trait I learned from my mother (laughs) I was just gonna say your mother's like that (laughs) so so I think that like I was never ashamed or embarrassed about coming from where I came from um but I did sort of start to see it's the 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 borders that were beyond what I knew in terms of how people lived and lifestyles and experiences. Um, I also felt, I think the other piece of going to a school like Brandeis or lots of schools like it is you can come in and feel like I'm not smart enough. I didn't earn my way. And I didn't feel that either. (laughs) I was like, I can be here. I am, you know, when I put effort and time into school, I do well. but I think it was a, it was really a little bit of a culture shock in terms of it, you know, um, the institution was sort of in the suburbs. So access to things, like I grew up kind of being able to go where I wanted, do what I wanted. So sort of that shift back to sort of like a quiet suburban institution was different. Um, and I think that I learned about I never saw myself as like a leader. I know like mm. you you would talk about, you know, and sort of build me up in my leadership. And and funny enough and ironically, I got a scholarship for leadership. So <laughs> I think people saw it in me. I didn't really see myself as a leader because I think I always saw leadership as positional mm. and I never really was attracted to like the positional leadership. Um, but I think that in college, I came into my own in understanding my type of leadership and sort of the ways in which I was very relational and could connect with people and knew a lot of people and, and how that could endear itself to getting people to listen to you and do the things that you need them to do, right? So I think that um, I also started to come into my own understanding of like my style of leadership, my mm-hmm. style of communication and connection with folks. And I think I cast a really wide net in terms of friends yeah. um, and, and was w- always sort of willing to try something at least once that yeah. seemed a little outside of the realm of what I maybe had t- positioned myself to be. So, so I think that those were like the pieces, but then also it was like, you look at people and be like, what? why are you doing that? Or, <laughs> <laughs> or just, you know, the way, like, co- obviously college is this time for exploration and people were exploring in ways that just didn't align with me. And so I would always just be like, what is happening? What My very doing? best friend in the world went to college with me, Jasmine. You know, <laughs> and we also were just like attached at the hip. So where you saw me, you saw her. And usually we would be like, what, what's happening here? We don't, want to be a part of this so we're gonna leave (laughs) so I also had like a good sort of home base in that I had a very good friend that like I I did the the journey with too wow and so you speak to the importance right of of community right like you went to the school with a community of people yeah and also you also had your own personal compass yeah right where you were like eh we're not doing that Uh, I mean, I had a Black immigrant mother, so that was the compass, for real. (laughs) She was like, I'm going to snatch you out of the (laughs) way. She don't play. I was like, I can't. There are certain phone calls that I just couldn't be calling her with. And so I was like, "Mm mm-mm. No, I, I, I love that. And so while you were there, you decided to major in what? So I majored in politics because I thought I was going to go to law school. So I was a politics major. 
um, and then a legal studies minor. Um, and quickly, I th no, not quickly, by my junior year, which is when you have to like declare your major, that's also usually the time when folks start to think about like what's next in terms of graduate school. And if you're doing any sort of like prep um, for a test of some sort, entrance exam for a particular graduate program, it's usually around your junior third year where you start to think about like, I gotta make this happen. If you wanna go like right after post-graduation. Mm -hmm. And I remember, it's so funny because my very best friend Jasmine um, we sometimes harken back to the story and she came to my, um, my hooding for, um, my doctorate and we had a dinner and she told the story at the dinner and I didn't remember that she remembered it, but I have always <laughs> remembered it. Um, we were on the T, which is like the Boston public transportation system. And I remember just saying, it was like on my heart and waiting on me that like, I just knew I didn't want to go to law school and I just mm -hmm. like hadn't said it out loud yet. Mm. um and we were just like on the tee and I was like I don't think I want to go to law school and she was like okay like very, <laughs> just like very matter of fact and then without missing a beat she was like well I think you should go into higher education she was like you're, wow. you're so involved yeah and you really like this stuff like why wouldn't you just do that and this is like it's so strange to think about we were literally going into Boston to get our hair done, a very mundane thing that we always did. And this like really life-changing conversation happened while we were like sitting on the T by Northeastern, like on our way to, to a hair appointment. Um, and it's something that literally, like I can visually like see where we were sitting. I could like see her, like it is just like, it's viscerally with me probably for forever mm -hmm. but it was truly like a life-changing like small conversation that we had that weirdly enough like gave me the confidence to be like yeah you're right I want and I that from that day on I switched mm -hmm. looked at graduate schools talk, started talking to people and it is like literally my career in my life so it's wow. it, it it really talks about like you know we talk about the power of words negatively Mm. but also the power of words positively to like really uplift you to your truth and your power and your destiny um for folks who like believe in that because that I, I just I remember that as like the marker and then I never never looked back and um thought like oh maybe I should have been a lawyer I I thought about like later in my career like getting a law degree but staying in higher ed so it was always gonna be higher ed but yeah, it just was like a very powerful conversation that was so small mm -hmm. and so innocent. And like, I didn't know that that's what was going to come of it. And she probably didn't know that like saying that to me was going to be like, oh, right. Alana found her career, right? So. Right. I mean, I've always loved, loved, loved Jasmine and, and, and just loved your choice of friends, right? Because it also speaks to, you know, which I talk about very, very often, like who you surround yourself with. And I remember I used to say that to you when you were younger. Like, who are your people, right? Because that's yeah. what my mother used to nag in my ear. Yeah. Right? The importance of, like, the people that you have around you really make a difference. Like, what if she would have said, girl, you've been talking about law school for years. What you talking about? Yeah. You know, yeah. then you would have left perplexed and confused. And I think you would have found your way, but it would have yeah. been a different journey, right? Right. And so... Congratulations to you for like hearing, receiving it. And I remember when she said that at the dinner, I was like, oh, I love Jen. <laughs> <laughs> but I it's a testament, it's a testament to you're right, like who you surround yourself with and like the trust that I I so I am an only child and a lot of my I don't have I like to say I have quality friends. I don't have qu a quantity of friends. Like I have colleagues and, 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 you know, acquaintances, but like friends who like I commit to like being really authentic with and sort of pulling back the layer. There's a small um, amount, but the, the trust that you have with a person to share a thing and know that like they're going to hear it receive it and what they're giving back to you is from a place of care 
and then you hearing that and and really believing it and receiving it so i, I and she and i have we've been friends for uh, tw almost 20 years it's it's crazy to think about now and we can tell each other the hard things or like we don't blow smoke right so like there are times when we have to have hard conversations with each other there are times when we have to say when we also have to have care with each other and like even if it's like i really know i need to tell her something that's like get yourself together but in the moment it's not the right time like wow. i need to give care so mm -hmm. i i do think that there's importance of a community to to build you up, to help you, to, to tell you the truth when you need it. Um, but also to make space for you to make mistakes and not say like, oh, I told you, or, you know, sort of yeah. come back. I remember, um, and sort of speaking to our relationship, I remember I was probably in high school, I was a senior in high school. And out of the blue, I remember you saying this and I was like, okay, this is my person. I always knew you were my person. Okay, now I gotta go get the tissue box. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was it was again. It was small. So, Cindy and I have had a close relationship in that I think sometimes things I couldn't feel comfortable telling my mom. I could talk to her about, you know, without a little bit of the judgment. I think that a parent sort of can put on mm -hmm. to things and. I remember, like, not out of the blue, but I remember you saying to me, you know, you can talk to me and you can trust that the things that we talk about are between us. Mm. And just hearing like, okay, I don't have to worry because I knew you had a relationship with my mom. I don't have to worry that you are running and sharing the things that I divulge. I don't have to, like, just the, I think at my, the age that I was, the protection and the care of um, my truth and my stories mm -hmm. and what I was telling you and saying like, this is between us and, and, and affirming, right? Like that ours was a relationship between us, I think is a, like a, such an important component to building friendship, building relationship, building trust, right? So it, it's interesting that I, I never had thought that you were doing that or like saying anything, but like the fact that you like honored me enough to say like, I want you to know that like we have a relationship, we have a dynamic, it's special, it's important, um, is meaningful, right? And sort of like how you build your tribe of people. Oh, I love that. Cause I remember your mother would be like, have you talked to Alana when you was away at college? And she's slick. And she I would is be a like, slick yeah, little yeah, hustler. To Alana and how she's doing. And I would be like, and, She's doing just fine. Stop asking me questions. <laughs> Anne is a slick little hustler. She tries to get you. Oh, that is that is so special. And I love to hear how you've you've built that because sometimes when we talk about success and career trajectory, right? And and we're getting there, we forget to talk about like the people that have supported us sometimes. Or the people that said that one thing that made us consider and say, hmm, like, I love that. And then you literally shifted, started applying to higher ed programs. And I remember within months, you were like, oh, yeah, I got accepted to ABC. And yeah, I start in the fall. I was like, what? <laughs> right? And so, and, and what was it about the higher education experience? Because I, I have a sister, you know, Dr. Sofia Pertus, who's been in higher ed for we see each people. other at conferences all the right. time. Well, Which when is, we were right out. when she was in the world, and yeah, I I remember her just being so immersed in in that world, and it seemed to me just so um, engaging, involved. And so, what was it about that work that spoke to you as a black woman in this higher education experience that led you to the work that you you started in higher ed? So I think a lot of people go into higher ed as like, in some ways, like an extension of their college years. Like Ooh. it's such, in some ways, it's like such a protective bubble. <laughs> and so the idea of like extending your time in this like wonderful, happy bubble um, is 
intriguing for folks. So I think for part of it for me at the start was like, I was really involved. Um, I found that I learned more about myself through the involvement that I was doing, whether it was like writing orientation, being involved with our black student organization, stuff like that. Like I was learning more about myself in those spaces than I felt like I was in the classroom. Mm. And, um, and so just off of that, I sort of was like, I work with all of these like staff who have like helped me learn about me. I kind of want to be that for someone else. Mm. And this is a like an environment that I know, I sort of like now know college and like the college environment. So I think that originally that was the draw. And then I went to graduate school and I moved to middle of the country. I moved to Indiana, Bloomington, which is like, I didn't even know it existed before I like applied there and got to do more diversity and inclusion work um, wow. in that I, my graduate assistantship was um, supervising students who did diversity education in the residence halls so I got to sort of take two aspects of like what I liked about college which was like program planning and then also I was like very involved in all the diversity efforts that were available so I kind of got to put them together and like help other students like do this programming and it was really interesting it was challenging given the location and sort of the the multiple um, understandings of the world that the different types of students that attend IU are bringing, right? Like you have students coming from like Chicago and New York, and then you have students that are from, you know, rural Indiana, right? So it's like, just like a whole hodgepodge of different types of people and different types of knowing relative to like the world and experience. So it just felt like a good exercise in working with students, sort of learning about how I build my muscle around diversity and inclusion and just the, the general things that paid my, like I got paid <laughs> and you know, I got my tuition <laughs> okay. covered, right? Like all of that stuff. So, um, and then once I like became a practitioner, I felt, I always felt like I was doing good work. I always felt like I was making good connections and I had really good relationships with the students that I worked with and I could sort of see the value in, um, I did more like co-curricular, like, like activities programming. So like working with student leaders and mm. I always felt like they were learning something and I could see their learning and their growth. And that was yeah. fulfilling. Um, and then I sort of got to a point in my career where I was doing my doctorate I was working full time um, and it was sort of, it had hit the point where I was getting to finishing the, the research portion and like really k kicking into the writing of my dissertation. Mm. And I was working in a student activities office, which is very, you know, quintessential college programming, like large scale concerts, mm. comedians, like all this stuff. So it's a lot of nights, a lot of weekends. It's just a lot of, work um, at different hours. And I remember I was driving to work on a Labor Day. It was like Labor Day because there was some programming that <clears throat> my office was responsible for. And I just was tired. Like, <laughs> I just felt tired. <laughs> and I thought to myself, I don't I don't want to be driving to work on Labor Day, right? Like, wow. there was just a little bit of a quality of life mm. imbalance that I was feeling. Yeah. That was also butting up against coming into the experience of writing my dissertation, doing my research, writing my dissertation, learning about, I looked at the experience of Black women at predominantly white campuses um, in relation to their gender, their race and social media, kind of what they put out about social media, about their race and their gender and how it affects their experiences on their campuses. Um, and what did and you I, find? I, I know I know what you found because I asked you and I saw well, it. But I'm curious if you could just give a snippet because yeah. that's so fascinating what you did. I, I found that, 
I found actually what we sort of people have been saying about black women that like we celebrate ourselves, we celebrate our accomplishments, <laughs> we that we lift each other up, and they the the women that I researched did that. So whether it was their own accomplishments or the accomplishments of other women, black women, they were you know really um intentional about lifting up the stories and the voices they were also intentional about if they saw another black woman that was being sort of attacked online sort of into trying mm. to interrupt that and yes um and and, and support them um and, and that they really saw and utilize their social media as like a platform for activism relative to like wow. what's happening on their campuses, yeah. um, relative to the experiences of students of color, um, particularly black students. And I was researching really in the in the height of um, the killing of black bodies by um, police. So mm -hmm. also they were centering the stories of the black men and women, like Sandra Bland was one that was mm -hmm. happening right as I was researching. They mm -hmm. were really um, intentional about sharing the story, saying her name and sort of talking about like, what do we do? So, so the, the performative activism oh, wow. connected then to their on-campus activism, definitely. Yeah. And and then they still, amidst that, sort of had to deal with the very um, stereotypical and quintessential experiences of just being a Black woman or a Black body in a predominantly white space. And sometimes they use social media to, to talk about that and to, you know, name some of those things. And other times they just use their community of Black women and Black students to support where they needed to. So, I mean, it was a great experience to do the research, to write about it, to really like name the stories and the experiences that I learned but I didn't have a job that really had a lot of connections to that. <laughs> you was like now I need the job <laughs> so then I was like I need a job a new job that maybe it's a little closer to nine to five even if it isn't always um but that provides that I can be a little more congruent with my interests and experiences and the work that I did and I think I told this to you I, I I had this moment where I was like my dissertation could like literally just be a book on a shelf um, or it could be a body of work that I can tap into to really understand and do work that is wow. intentional and holistic so yes. I shifted to I think the other thing I was talking about this with a friend recently when I left grad, so I graduated in, from my graduate program in 2008. And now in 2021, the landscape for diversity and inclusion work in higher education is significantly different. So, uh -huh. you know, I don't know that I was actually ready to do DNI work mm -hmm. in 2008, but I felt sort of more informed and in knowing myself as a person and sort of like how I operate as a professional, I feel so much more grounded in the work. Um, plus there's more opportunity. So, you know, when I was looking for a straight out of grad school, it was like maybe one position at each school. And there usually was someone that was in that position that you'd have to <laughs> wait out. <laughs> or, or there wasn't one, there would be like maybe someone that had like a dual role so they were doing like mm -hmm. res life and also supporting like students got right. Mm -hmm. And it's so different now in terms of the types of positions and the types of opportunities that are available if you are interested in doing DNI work um, in higher ed. So I think now there's the the mixture of like I I think I'm like a more mature and seasoned practitioner, coupled with there are just way more opportunities to um to do the work at sort of different types of institutions, different types of work, so. Now for those folks that are listening that are not familiar with higher education work or familiar with the terminology of diversity, equity, and inclusion, which is what DEI is, could you tell us a little bit, and you, I'm not telling you to give us your job description, right? Because there's probably so many things that you can, <laughs> right? But, you know, in thinking about your role because as you were telling me about your job like the passion as you were sharing it was infectious right and and, and i'm always so excited when people are able to connect 
their values, their interests with something they could actually get paid for, right? Like yeah. not many of us are in that space. So yeah. that you were able to navigate to that space is phenomenal, Doctora Anderson. And um, so one, I wanna ask you like, what made you pursue a doctorate? Cause you kind of skipped that part. Like what made you say, oh, I'm ready for this. Well, I wanna do this, right? And was it connected to what you wanted to eventually seek as an outcome or was that sort of just part of the trajectory that eventually you said, I want to do DEI work? So in um, the higher education space, um, I think in the last 10 to 15 years to move up to mm -hmm. a vice president's role of some sort at this point. So when I started to pursue my doctorate, I was, um, like an assistant director. So I was like a mid-level um, person in a role at an institution. And so the more you move up, the more there's an expectation that you have an advanced degree. Mm -hmm. um, so at that point in my career, I was like, of course, I want to be like a vice president for student affairs. Yes, you so. better speak it. You better speak it, okay? So, so I, and this is again where thinking about like the who you are and sort of how you occupy an environment is important. So I am a person who just never wants to worry that I don't have as many of the qualities that some like an like something is um, an opportunity or experience requires. So I remember thinking, well, if I get to the point where I am like ready for vice president type of roles. Like I have the years of experience and I have the, the right types of job experience. I don't want them to say, well, she doesn't have a doctorate, so she can't mm -hmm. come into the door. Mm -hmm. I never wanted to be held back because I didn't have a credential. So I was like, well, I'm going to get a credential and I'm going to get the credential. Um, also coupled with, I was like ready to go back to school. <laughs> and I like school. <laughs> because they do say like, you shouldn't just go for like job attainment. Like you should actually like really want to, you know, spend four to five years of your life, like committed to, <laughs> to a cause. So I was also like, you know, I had been out of um, my graduate program about five years at that point. And I was like, okay, I'm like ready to go back to school. You know, a doctorate I think would be great. The idea of doing research would be interesting. I'm gonna go for it. Um, and a part of it was also, I went to Boston College. It was just logistics of like BC had a higher ed program. They had a PhD program. So I applied and I kind of was just like, um, this will be my first pass, I'll apply. I want to do it part-time and also work. If I don't get in or it doesn't work out, um, then I'll think about maybe doing a full-time program somewhere else, right? So I was just like, I'm just going to do this first pass, see what happens, and then go. Well, I got in. I got support from my supervisor <laughs> to um, do a program, and kind of off I went. So I, I feel like it was just important to me as Black woman to be able to go into spaces and feel like I'm armed with mm. the experience, the mm. credentials, the language to do what I need to do. And I think that not everybody has to think about stuff like that mm -hmm. and in that way, but I'm, and now doing diversity and inclusion work, I'm even more <laughs> hyper aware of how folks are received in the room based upon what they have or don't have in education and credentials. So, so I think it was a little bit of like, I want to be armed with the right package with also, you know, I was ready to go back to school. I was ready to, you know, um, take on class coursework and classes and, and to, the the other part of your question, I didn't go into a doctorate program thinking like I want to do DNI work. Mm. Um, I sort of was like, oh, I'm gonna eventually be a vice president for student affairs. I got, I think it was probably my second or third year in my doctorate. 
I took a critical race theory class. And for folks who may be watching it, critical race theory is a um, theoretical framework, a theory um, that a lot of folks use to help understand the areas of our world that are um, systemically racist. And it helps to um, investigate where that racism comes from, like the structure, the policies that have sort of embedded in areas of our society that we just take to be um, and know to be sort of important, the courts, policing, you know, school, education system. And it really works to help understand that they have been built and um, continue to sort of reinforce systems of oppression against black and brown bodies. And mm. so I took yeah, a class speaking. where mm. <laughs> I'm all I, in it like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, mm. And I, I wasn't familiar with the course before I took the class. Um, but it was, I think it like fit in my schedule. I think my super, my advisor was like, I think you should take this. And my mind was like blown in taking the class in terms of like the professor who I took it with was phenomenal. Um, it was also sort of, again, this like critical time where stuff was happening in the country. Um, like I think we, in our class, we talked a lot about and watched the um, the video where, for, um, not the video, but we talked about Freddie Gray when Freddie Gray was killed in Baltimore, right? So like, sort of capsulizing cap, you know, capsulize that time in our country. So it really helped me understand and sort of put language to how, how far beyond diversity we need to be, right? So diversity is really asking the question of like, who's in the room in terms of like identity, but we needed to be doing more. And I always like felt that and like, yeah conversations I was having in higher education and spaces with folks of like, it just isn't just get brown people in a room yes. and like, it's going to fix things. Yeah. But I didn't have the language to know like what else to be saying or how to mm -hmm. say it. And that That's class so really like empowered me with that language. And it also, I think was where I start, my husband would say, um, the class was on like, I think it was on a, a Wednesday or a Thursday night. And he was like, <laughs> you used to come home fired up. <laughs> <laughs> because I was just like learning all this stuff and just like helping. You would be like, "Don't talk to me." I'm like, "That's what is racist." <laughs> and so at the and I remember at the end of the semester, I was like, "Man, I really like that class." And he was like, "Oh, I know." <laughs> wow. I just was like, and so and I think that probably was when I was like, "Okay, I want to be in this. I want to do more with this. I want to see." where I sit in helping to advance and discuss these issues within my, excuse me, my sphere of influence within higher ed. Wow. Wow. So powerful, Alana, because I am thinking about all the people that are listening, those of us that have gone to college, you could think of that one faculty member that just blew your mind. And to think that you get to be that faculty member to other, you also teach yeah. on the university level, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. so how powerful, because what you're talking about too is this journey, right? That we have this journey and sometimes we know what we're, we're stepping into. Sometimes like just being open to the possibility. Like you've yeah. talked again and again about like this possibility that you were always open to, whether yeah. it was new friendships, whether it was new, new course trajectory, you know, the doctorate, look, exploring different possibilities. Right. And, and sometimes we block ourselves from ourselves yeah. <laughs> when we're not opening up ourselves to opportunities and possibilities. Yeah. And so I want to honor you and congratulate you for honoring yourself in the journey. Yeah. Because sometimes we're like, what did I, did I, you know? And, and, and what's so fascinating is that when we talked about having this conversation, you know, the title that you brought to the fore, right, was like from doubt to relief, right? Like there were they, these moments of doubt 
but no matter what you chose, you always had this sense of, I, I did the right thing. I'm, I'm good. Yes. Right? <laughs> yeah. Even yeah. the things that didn't work out. Mm. So I think we always are like, only the things that go our way and the way that like we've engineered it. But I think about the things like the job that I really thought that I wanted, it was going to be perfect. And then I didn't get it, but it opened up another opportunity that led me to meet someone else that I'm still, you know, like just yeah. the ways in which life twists and turns. And I think as we were talking about like being open, I, you know, we, my mother is, I think that I am a product of my mother in a lot of ways that I think I'm still sort of coming into learning about. <laughs> but, I love that. Um, she, just watching her, she ha is always like that. She's always like, oh, I'm going to like try this thing or I'm going to, or you, you ask her like, oh, what are you doing now? And she's like, oh, I, you know, I just decided that I was going to take on this like other project or you know like growing up she was um she did community college and i remember at community college she like took on a a part-time job and she like worked at the library and then through that she like met this other person that like got her connected to this thing and so i spent growing up because it was just like when i I was either in school or with her. Like my mother didn't play. She wasn't having me with anybody. <laughs> so I, I just remember her network always mm. feeling like it was vast. Yeah. And that I think, and sort of her persona to talk to people, to, to connect with people and not in a way that was like, I'm using you for your stuff. It was more mm -hmm. just in like, I'm going to talk to you about your thing. I remember okay. that you like this thing. I'm going to ask you about it again. And I, I find that I am like that. And so, but, but with that, it's funny because sometimes my mom will, I'll talk to her about something. She's like, you know, all these people. And I want to be like, but you, you know, know all, all these people. people. <laughs> like this is a product of you. Um, but the ways in which I think that the, the saying yes, or being open or shifting, um, can also be a way to like connect with mm. others and yes. you know so so yes. I, I i get it's so funny because i am not really great at like the very traditional sense of networking i don't think and i'm not really great with um small talk like i don't really like <laughs> not really good with people I don't know <laughs> like I just it's just not my wheelhouse I run out of things to say when like if you watch me in like a new environment where I'm talking to someone inevitably I will run out of something to say and then I will find a way to exit <laughs> and, and go to someone I know mm -hmm. but um but to use can like to use my village and maybe it's maybe I'm saying village and it's network and it's the same to like connect with people that I know to sort of like talk through things or to um, one of the things like, for example, I'm, I'm teaching this class and this um, young woman in the class asked me to, if I knew anyone who worked in college, in high school counseling. And I was like, oh my gosh, I know my friend Lauren. I knew her from working at MIT. We've stayed connected. There's like a little, um, like I have a little group chat with some women that I work with from MIT who we've stayed connected. I was, I texted her, I was like, can I connect you to this student? I think the student thought it was a long shot that I would know someone, but in the recesses of my mind, I was like, oh my gosh, I absolutely know someone. Or like um, my husband also works in the field. And so I tease, but it's actually really true. And sometimes it gets them annoyed that when we go to conferences, I would be like, okay, if we're walking and, I could stop because I see somebody. I was like, just leave me. Like, keep going. <laughs> because, and he's like, oh, that sounds pretentious. I... But we'll start walking and I'll like run into someone I like did an internship with or did this with, right? So I think that there's, there is sort of a, when you are open to things and, and you have a, 
a journey or a map, but you're not so rigid to it that like, if it doesn't work, you're just like mm -hmm. chaos ensues. But you're, but you're open to the possibility of something else coming in, um, in lieu of the thing that you wanted. I think it just opens you up to people, opens you up to relationships, opens you up to connections. And um, I think that builds out your village in a way wow. that I think is important. Mm -hmm. Wow. You drop so many jewels. I mean, I don't know if you notice people chatting away, but Lee said, it's amazing how you end up where you're supposed to be, even when you never planned it that way. Thank you yeah. for sharing all of this, right? Yeah. And I remember, so Alana, when I was pregnant with my daughter, <laughs> the doctor told me I couldn't drive anymore. And just one more time, every time. And so time. Alana honored me by being with me like all that time. It's so funny. I have this picture and, and just thinking about that picture puts tears in my eyes. Yeah. And it's of you holding, I think I texted to you, yeah. Nyla's hand, right? Yeah. And yeah. at the graduation, right? And like now my daughter's a freshman in college and you're like doing that damn thing. And I'm so yeah. proud of you, Dr. Alana Anderson. I'm so proud of the woman that you are, who you continue to to grow into. And I know that you have, continuously pouring into others because that's just who you are and, and I know that and I'm so grateful oh. for you I'm grateful for you saying yes <laughs> and so at this time I like to ask the audience if you have any questions for our guest Dr. Alana Anderson who who just dropped so many jewels like I always listen to the interviews again days later and because I'm all in it sometimes I miss things and you dropped so much knowledge. I wonder mm -hmm. if a book is in progress about how, you know, there's just so many things you could write about. I mean, right now you talked about like this journey, the trajectory, um, you know, being this beacon of light, sort of all the spaces that you've been in and, and still uh, being vulnerable to the uncertainty of it all, right? Yeah, I, um, no, no thought of a book. I wrote recently, um, my husband makes fun of me because I, um, took on a, uh, book review project and it was like a labor of love to get it written and, <laughs> and edited. And, and then on the other side of it, and he heard me grumble about it this summer. Oh, the book review. I was just like putting it off, putting it off. I finally did it. It was like hard. It wasn't that hard, but I was just like building it up. And then, I finally got it sent away. It was edited, done. And I looked at him one night. I was like, oh my gosh, that was really great. I think I should do that again. And he like rolled his eyes because he was like, no, <laughs> I'm not taking that on. That's ridiculous. Um, but I do, I think as I've gotten older, I've been more thoughtful about um, the power of writing and like mm -hmm. the written word and um and so I, I do a five minute journal um, yeah, yeah. and it sort of, it has prompts um, that, that's sort of been helpful. But no, I, I mean, I think that I should probably consider um, writing and publishing is, is, a, is a component that I, um, I want to do more of. Um, yeah. I just have to sort of like find the time and space yeah. for it. I will say too, um, that picture that you referenced is one of my favorite pictures ever. And I remember when my husband and I first started dating, um, we were sitting on my couch in graduate school and I was like flipping through photo a photo album, like for young people, we used to like print our pictures. And right. <laughs> and he came across that picture and he stopped and like, and it, it, this was like early in our courting and he was just like, can you like, like, tell me about that picture? And I sort of just, I talked about you and your family and, um, and he like, it just like almost took his breath away. Like the sort of, he was like there, he was like, without realizing it, he was like, there's so much meaning to the picture for folks who haven't seen the picture. It's, I am in like full graduation garb, cap and gown, the whole thing. This is my college graduation. And Naila's just in like the cutest little dress. She's so little. 
and um and I but it, and it like takes me back to that day I remember like coming out and like seeing you all and waving at you but but he 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 hearkened to sort of this like the power of that picture and like you know I wasn't even that old I was like probably like 21 20 21 but passing on his experience passing on yes. knowledge but also just the love that like you know we have like she's looking at me I'm looking at her like and it, it it's a, it's still to this day like one of my very favorite pictures um because it's just like everything you can see in the picture beyond the actual picture oh my um, goodness and so <laughs> did I mess up my makeup <clears throat> sorry girl sorry to you <laughs> but thank you I mean cuz you said that I mean the love and care so when I was pregnant with Naila I was a single mom and I still lived in the building and Alana he used to come see me every day after school. I used to every day. Spend the night. She used to spend the night. And she was like my road dog. Like we were <laughs> going to Bed Bath and Beyond and all these different places. And so babies are you know, RIP, the babies are us. Right. And the babies are us. And the love that I have for you is so immense for your family. Um, and I'm so proud of you. Like as you're sharing that story, the tears are tears of joy of like the woman that I knew you would become, like the woman that was stalking me to buy chocolate, right? And and to, I knew it, I knew it, I knew it. I remember declaring it over your life. And I'm so proud because I feel like there's just so much more that you're gonna end up doing. And we talked about a possible article that we would write together. Yes, we, <laughs> no, we will write that article. <laughs> right, and Christy, I remember Christy. Christy said, she will read any book that you write, Alana. So Christy said it. So so if anyone has any last question before I get like booger, ugly, crying, <laughs> um, please post it in the question box. Lee thanks you for Aww. just everything that you shared. She said that you talked about how you just knocked down walls and you describe it so humbly. I remember I was talking to my brother and I said, oh, yeah, I'm going to interview Alana. So he listens to the interviews on YouTube because he doesn't have Instagram. And he said, Alana, what's she up to? And then I told him, and he was just so proud of you. He said, oh, my gosh, I had no idea. <laughs> so what's one last word that you would like to share with folks um, as we close out this amazing talk? You know, I... Um... I think that there is so I to to hear my story and to sort of hear that um I knocked down walls and and um even sort of the praise that you've been giving is it is certainly very humbling and I think mm -hmm. um it is I get sometimes embarrassed by it, but I, I, I have to sort of live in it um, and be proud of it. Mm. I, I think that there is a testament to the importance of not just a village, but you know, like finding your people, finding your tribe. Mm. Um, because I think that, like for me, your family has always been that. And I come from like a smaller sort of uh, nuclear family. And once we connected and, you know, my family was adopted into your family, it became that I had, uh, you know, a collection of literally older sisters and older brother in your siblings. And so to know that I had folks in, in that tribe and mm -hmm. to know that um, those were people that were rooting for me that, you know, never set these like unattainable expectations, but really did celebrate the milestones along the way. Right. So, you know, I, Sophia and I, every time we see each other at conferences or you know, when the world was open, we'd like hug, we grab a drink, we or we get lunch, or we'd see each other, right? And like we'd always be like, 
if we were like meeting someone else, a colleague of someone else, we'd like give the story of how we know each other, right? And like it was like, <laughs> this like That's wonderful beautiful. sort of like reunion piece. Um, and I think that like to have folks that are your people and your tribe and your community helps with the the doubt and then mm -hmm. the praise right because then you have people that if you're nervous about something you can call and talk to or you know it w without a doubt like any when i was planning like my um for my graduation from my doctorate it, it was without a doubt my husband and i were like okay who are we going to invite and i was like okay cindy and the the other you know same and my in-laws and like all these like it just was like a, a non-negotiable to sort of have mm -hmm. the folks in the room your tribe your people right and i i think that sometimes we think that we can do all of this in spite of or mm -hmm. without asking for um i told you this story um when we talked but like i tease my husband a lot around that um when i was writing my dissertation i'd be like okay Ryan, you have to like <laughs> remind me to write. Like I just need to write tonight. Like it'd be like a Saturday night. I'd be like, I just need to write. Like you have to help me. And he'd be like, All right, I got it. And you know, for folks who don't know my husband, he's wonderful. He is um a funny man, just like but but like you put him to a task, he's like, I'm gonna do this task. So it, we'd eat dinner and then he'd be like in a loving loving supportive way he'd be like all right babe it's time to write now and i would look at him and i'd be like don't tell me what to do <laughs> you don't understand what i'm going through right now i'll write when i'm ready to write don't tell me what to do and he would be like i just you and then the next night i'd be like ryan seriously no you gotta really push me right <laughs> so it's like your people take that they take all of like your messiness so um I think the last thing I would want to say about this is that I haven't done all of this in s without support, help, you know, people wow. in my corner, people to sort of lift me up or to tell me to get myself together. And I, I think that that's super important to anybody's story is that um, usually we don't write these without other cast mm -hmm. of characters supporting mm -hmm. and those people are like, at least to my story, they're like really important. And obviously you are one of the ones that is very centered to the story. And I adore you. And I think that you're wonderful and I'm so proud of you. So. Thank you. Well, I receive it. I re I've, been working, <laughs> I've been working on receiving the compliments, <laughs> receiving just all the love. And so thank you. So I am so grateful for you today. Thank you for those that were able to come on live. Eileen has been, I think, on every single one of my conversations. You're going to get an award, Nana, an award. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, I am taking a hiatus. This is the end of season one of Candid okay. Conversations. Um, uh, I'll probably start back up, I think, in May. We'll see. Maybe April or May. Uh, so you didn't even know that you were going to be my last guest. Season finale, season. I like it. The season finale with uh, fabulous Dr. Alana <laughs> uh, Anderson. And so thank you so much because you poured so much into me that you have no idea. Like I literally have a chapter to write for a textbook about diversity It's and all this other stuff about school social work. And there was one idea that I had in terms of the trajectory that I was going in, uh, but you just helped shift something so significantly so thank you so much i love you so much and i care about you and i can't wait to see what you do next i love you too thanks for having right. me take care bye-bye